Hello. Okay, everyone can. Yeah. Cool. Uh, my name is Niklas uh, Jacobson, and I'm a uh, visual effects supervisor and co-founder of Important Looking Pirates. And I'm going to start. See, yeah, you can see everything here. Um, I, I wanted to start today uh, with a brief introduction of our company, an ILP, and try to give you a little bit of background of what we do and, and why we do things in order to, I think, create a better understanding for um, how we think and, and what, uh, why, why we do what we do. And uh, then I'm going to go into the case study of Crossbones, uh, which was a very fun project that we finished last year. And then I'm going to have a little surprise in the end. I'm going to show you some uh, breakdown material of another uh, project that we just finished that hasn't been uh, broadcasted anywhere. So, um, and after that, we'll do some questions and answers. So, important looking pirate. We are a visual effects company based in Stockholm, Sweden. And we are currently 40 uh, in our permanent staff. And we do uh, commercial work. We work with television series and feature films and games and web. And, uh, and we have, we're interested also in intellectual property. We have two short films in production currently. So we do a wide range of stuff. And, and um, I believe that visual effects is, is just content creations. And, and we, we just want to do cool stuff. And so um, that, that, that's, that's what we do. And I'm going to show you our showreel to give a little bit taste of what kind of, for the ones that uh, do not know about our company, what kind of projects we do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about last year. Last year was a fantastic year for us. Um, uh, we did our first television series, Crossbound, and uh, we followed that up with the work on Constantine as well. And it was really exciting work uh, getting into the television series work. We also um, we have just uh, delivered our first American feature film. We did work on Everest. 
And so, so we have been expanding a bit. Last time in 2013, when I was here, we were 25 people. Now we're 40. And, uh, and this has been a milestone for us to, uh, we have always wanted to be a kind of a mid-sized company, a company where you could take on a sequence, like a cool sequence from a film or a television series and, and still maintain our commercial work. And you kind of, um, we're kind of finding that uh, size and landing on this now, and we're, we're still looking for a few key people in order to, to, to find that um, organization. But we're, we're very happy with uh, what, we, what we do and where we are today. And um, in, in 2013, I was here talking about Contiki, and then I did a, a, a similar presentation like this, and I, uh, when I talked about the company, then I talked more about infrastructure and software and hardware, more fact-based fact uh, about our company. And, and today I'm here to talk about Crossbones, and, and during the pre presentation of our company, I would like to focus more on, a, on philosophy and our vision and values to to give you an idea of what we want to become. So this is our vision. ILP is to become one of the top international suppliers of visual effects in terms of quality, professionalism and service. We will run a good sustaining business that attracts and keeps the best personnel in the industry in order to provide visual imagery of the highest quality. So this is the core. I mean, we want to do VFX and we want to do high quality VFX. And we want to run a sustaining business because we're in for the long game. Uh, we want to, um, you know, keep doing this. We, we, we worked abroad before we started ILP and, and now we have settled in Stockholm. We want to uh, have that base and do the same kind of cool work that they're doing at all these great international studios, but home uh, in, in Stockholm. And, um, and the personnel, um, that's the key. Uh, the artists are... Um, are everything in our business because we we are uh, we're consultants. We are we are doing uh, the, the, we are only invoicing for the for the time we put down. So that is something that is really important to us the, to find these great artists and to create a company and environment to keep them. Um, and then I'm gonna. Um, um, th that is our vision and where we want to head, and I also want to uh, talk a little bit about our current mindset on, on how, it, how we're going to try to achieve this. And uh, One of the goals for me and my uh, co-founder, Jaffe, uh, has always been to create a company where we ourselves would like to work. We want to work on exciting projects, and we want to have a, a challenging and, and developing environment that where we get to grow. Uh, we want to work with nice people and talented people, and we want to have the tools and pipeline and infrastructure and technology to, to support that. And uh, we want sustainability, and we, were, uh, we want great conditions. That's really important, because we believe that uh, in order to succeed, you also need to balance with, uh, to have time with uh, friends and family. And most important, we want to have fun. That's why we are in this business to begin with. Um, and I, I want to talk about, um, I believe there's a concept of, uh, of becoming successful in this industry or in, uh, in end, any industry really, and that's the concept of design and process. And um, uh, design is uh, the first thing you come to think of, uh, which is quite clear. You need creative people. Uh, able to, to, to design visual effects, to light a shot, or to composite an image, or, or to convey a story use, using vi vi visual effects. That's very important. I mean, you, you need great people to do that. But another concept uh, uh, that I would like to focus on today is the concept of creative people uh, designing the process. And, and by process, I mean how we do stuff and why we do stuff and the purpose why we do this. And this is equally as important, but it's sometimes easier to forget. Um, so the, the process of, um, of, of what we do is something that really excites us. And, and there's something that uh, uh, we, would, we, we want to approve across all departments. And we're, we're doing, you, you can, um, 
anything you do within your company is a process. Everything from bidding on projects to communicating to hiring, lighting a shop, everything can be designed for a purpose. So I'm going to bring an example for if you take uh, just bidding, bidding on projects, how you break down the process of bidding uh, to make it easy and accurate and efficient. Uh, do all of your producers and supervisors bid the same way, or can there be discrepancies in, in, in the result, depending on who does the bid? Can you e easily access uh, data of similar shots um, that you have previously done in order to Im improve that? Um, is your bid bidding template connected to other systems? Do you have, uh, are you aware of resourcing or or the competence or special, special abilities that you have uh, internally uh, and dynamic rates. There's so much stuff that you, can, that you should think, uh, think of when you're designing how, how you do work. And that's something that we're really trying to focus on. Um, another big, uh, super big uh, topic is communicating. I mean, uh, what is the different requirements uh, for communicating within different departments? Uh, what, what role has their physical seating in their actual office in, in that? And do you sit in departments? Do, do you sit in project groups? Or, or do you sit uh, wherever you want? Because maybe that is the best way of doing stuff. Um, do you have other tools to ease communications like messaging system or chat system that renders uh, physical placement uh, redundant? So all these processes is... Uh, uh, can be designed, and you need creative people to do this, because, uh, let's see here, I'm going to go, we want to do uh, great images, uh, but we also take a lot of pride in, in how these uh, great images uh, are done. I mean, you can have two images that look uh, very, very similar, but the story, uh, how you came to that result, can be vastly different, and we're interested in that story. Because in the end, when, when you're able to create like beautiful and awesome looking images, then the process on how they are made is the only thing that is left. It, it, that is what you're competing with. Um, I can uh, appreciate a, a great piece of art, for example. But when I learned that it took a thousand artists, a thousand years to complete it, I will still appreciate that piece of art, but I, I might not adapt that methodology and, and try to run a competitive business uh, in that way. So the, uh, the process really excites us, and we have set a very high bar for our future. And we believe in the human capacity uh, and I also believe that the world in general, uh, general is run very inefficiently. Um, it, when I talk to people close to me, like friends and family, whatever, and talking about work environments, there's always a lot of opinions uh, on, on how, how things is done, or there, there's a lot of opinions on maybe management and things like that. And it feels like there, there's so much... Uh, things that can, can be improved on. There's so much knowledge in the people that are working in, in your uh, place uh, that you need to kind of harvest. You need to, you need to encourage people to, to speak up, to contribute. And as manager, managers, I think it's super important for you to, to, to listen to your personnel. And uh, we want to... Um, encourage, we try to have an, uh, encourage an informal work environment where we help each other out and to develop our skills and free from competition in between the crew internally. And uh, we have a hierarchy in terms of responsibility, but not in the communication. It's, it's really important that uh, ideas can, you never know where the great ideas are going to come from. It can be from the interns at your, uh, in your office or uh, anything. So anyone should be able to talk uh, to anyone and suggest ideas. That's something that is really important for us. If you're working uh, and, and you feel that uh, something is uh, very repetitive or something that you, you do is really stupid, then it's your, 
it's your duty, it's your responsibility to speak up. And that's what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to create a culture where everyone contributes to the development of the company. Um, So, um, yeah, purpose-driven workflow. The, 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 that's the, main, the, the concept there, that uh, you should always uh, consider the purpose in anything you do. And another very, very important aspect is to constantly fight uh, prestige and ego. But that's something that really can cloud one's judgment and, and hinder one's growth. Um, if there is someone within our company, in our organization, that, that can do a better job or on, on our responsibility on a task than you, then the natural thing you should do is to step aside and, and uh, encourage that rather than uh, empowering old structures. And, you know, uh, I think that is a very important thing because you can see with every generation, all the new students and all the people that are coming out from schools, they are, they are awesome, man. There's so much, uh, uh, there's so much talent out there, and I think it's uh, it's important to create an organization that is uh, swift and can adapt and you know empower people to grow within the company. And another super important thing here is uh, the concept of iterating and evaluate. We don't have uh, all the answers uh, at all, but but you should try to just you do stuff and iterate and evaluate. Make sure to evaluate uh, uh, in the same way as, as we're doing when, when we're working physically with the images. Maybe we're doing dailies when we're reviewing the work and stuff. It's equally important to evaluate all the processes within the organization, uh, organizations and, uh, and, and test new ideas and, and uh, see if they work and, and then follow up and, 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 and talk what went wrong and invite people into those, these conversations. This is, a, uh, this is a nice quote that I saw on Twitter. The secret to your future is hidden in your daily routine. Um, I, I believe it was a television priest or something that said uh, this. But either way, I, I there's something uh, very true to this. And it ties together with this iterating and just make sure you do stuff and, and make sure to evaluate. And that's the only way to, to really progress for, your, for the future. Mm -hmm. So improving, um, it's not easy. It, it requires careful analysis. It requires an open mind and self-awareness of, of one's capabilities. Uh, it requires patience and strength and passion. And, uh, and it's, it requires to put one's prestige and egos aside. And uh, we, we do not sit uh, on all the answers on how we're going to achieve our goals or, or how we're going to uh, achieve this. But, but we, this is our mindset. This is something that we really care about. And we, we're going to try with the best of our capabilities to, to figure this out. And there's so much... Um, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, there's so much uh, great people here at FMX. There is... Uh, there's people from the software industry and the hardware industry. There's so many people trying to figure out how to work with visual effects, creating awesome uh, technology or software for us to use. And there's also a lot of managers and artists here. So and I'm, 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 for one, just going to make the most of my time here and, and, um, and trying to you know, exchange ideas and talk to people because that, that, that is how you develop and grow. So now, um, that is a uh, little bit of, about our company. I'm going to show you um, the crossbones, uh, the breakdown, and then we're going to talk about that.
Thank you. Okay, so introduction and background. Uh, Kevin Blank was uh, the overall visual effects supervisor uh, from the studio side, and he contacted us in fall of 2013 and told us about this project that he would like us to bid on. Um, uh, a pirate show that ta uh, ta takes place in the Caribbean, and it's uh, starring John Malkovich as uh, Captain Blackbeard. And uh, we were super excited about this. Uh, important looking pirates working on a pirate show. This is, this is what we have been waiting for. So that was really, really cool. And um, we were ha very happy that we got the uh, chance to bid on this. And it was all due to our work on, on Contiki and the breakdown. And, and uh, that really put us uh, on, on the map internationally. And, um, the reason I want to start talking about uh, Kevin is that uh, I believe that he has a big, he, big part of the success of this project. And um, I want to tie this together with uh, the process that I was talking about earlier. So our work consisted of uh, approximately 100 VFX shots across the 10 episodes. And it was mostly about uh, digital environments and, uh, and digital ships. And, and the requirements for this, uh, since it's a television series, it's, uh, it's different budgets from working with feature films. So uh, we needed to come up with a very cost efficient solution uh, to do all of these great uh, shots. It's less time and it's uh, less money than with the film. And uh, uh, so we agreed on putting um, uh, on a lot of, of time into pre-production. Um, and and that, that was key in order to be able to, to do this uh, cost effective. And we needed to be able to do fast assemblies of, sh uh, of, of the scenes from assets and turn them over very quickly. And uh, pre-production is something that is so important because if you're looking at that, we did over 100 shots. And if you can do something, if you can prepare for something so you can cut, let's say, one day off in shot production, that's 100 days off if you're looking across the entire project. So pre-production is something that I strongly um, uh, uh, value. It's uh, super important. It was a big, uh, big part of the success of this project. And um, so we were, uh, and, and that's the thing, that Kevin, he has a great understanding of, of the importance of this process. And, uh, and we assembled a small team of approximately seven people that did all the pre-production work um, of the show. We did all the, the R&D and the asset creation and the prep work uh, for uh, about four months. And, and during this time, uh, we, we got, to, we was, Kevin, he supported us and, and you know, uh, understood the importance of this. And um, at one time, we stumbled upon some troubles with, uh, with the rig or, or with the setup of one of the hero ships. And we felt that we needed to pause the work on that in order to, uh, 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 we needed to pause the work on all shots using that ship in order to improve the setup. So rather than struggling fixing, uh, fixing problems with multiple shots, we could uh, fix the rig and then we get back in the, in, into production and, and you know, do it uh, very efficiently. And it's, uh, things like that was never a problem. And, uh, and uh, it was easy to discuss those methodologies. And, 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 they, and Kevin managed the expectations from production side of thing and creating space for us to do things right. And in return, it enabled us to come up with a really cost-effective solution where we uh, were able to do super great work uh, on a fairly small team. So we had, it was four months of uh, pre-production and uh, a little bit, uh, a few of the shots started uh, during the pre-production as well. And uh, we did two months of shot production um, and where we picked uh, around 15 people. So it was quite a small team. And we managed, in the end, we managed to turn over uh, full CG shots in, in less than a week. So the, we worked straight towards the goal with this. I mean, and, and this ties back to the thing, you, ha you can have two images and the story behind 
how you're working to that goal can be so vastly different. And in this case, it was uh, very straight to the point, I mean, which enabled us to put uh, all the time in perfecting the shots and just making it look good. It wasn't uh, any cases of uh, redesigning, adding another mask. It wasn't so much, um, the process went quite smooth. We did it in, in the right order, if you will. Um, so, and, and also, all the feedback that we, we got was very purpose-driven, and it was, uh, it was uh, uh, we got a good feel for the background, the reason, what is important with this shot, what do we need to convey, and that made us feel like a part of the production, rather than just a post-facility doing the VFX. We were invited to contribute like creatively so we understood what the reason was for this shot and what the purpose was and that made the that was uh, that that felt really good and um i i hope to see that uh, even more in the future that the production of a feature film or a television series can include the visual effects and work together as one of their internal departments there's a lot to be gained from that So, uh, then I'm going to talk about the different uh, stages in the pre-production. And we, um, we, had, um, we had two ships, no, we had four ships to design. Two ships was, uh, uh, they had the live action versions of this on set. So they had actually two fantastic ships uh, on set in Puerto Rico, which they shot, uh, which we recreated for some, uh, for some CG shots. And, uh, then we had two uh, hero ships that uh, didn't have any uh, live action counterparts, so they were designed from the ground up. And it was the um, Englishman big warship the Spani uh, and the Spanish uh, uh, fleet ship. And uh, on top of that, we did alterations also. So we, we took these four um, hero ships, if you will, and did alterations in order to populate shots in harbors and, uh, and, and the shots where we had, we had fleets of ships. Uh, and we, we did get some um, great concepts from uh, the art department, uh, paint over from, on, on the actual live action ships. But we also uh, managed to, to get a lot of great references from the Vasa Museum, which uh, it's a museum in Stockholm, quite close to our office, actually, um, where they have the Vasa ship on display. And that is a Swedish uh, warship that uh, it sank on its maiden voyage in 1621. And it lied in the bottom of the ocean, just outside of, uh, of the harbor in Stockholm, for like 300 years, and which they managed to salvage and, uh, and restore. And, and today, that is one of the, the best preserved uh, uh, ships from this time era in the world. So that was uh, very inspiring and, and, uh, to go to the museum and, and, and study it in details and take a lot of pictures and stuff. And uh, then we had the pre-production, uh, the modeling and texturing and look development. So since we didn't knew, uh, know during pre-production uh, the exact layouts uh, of the digi digital ships that we were going to do, we made sure to uh, spread the detail e evenly and put a lot of efforts into, into the process of doing the, the modeling and texturing of the ship. So we were flexible of being able to do, yeah, we could do a little bit, uh, we could, uh, we, it ho held up very for close-up shots and, and uh, that became a very flexible tool once they were in the edit putting this show together. Uh, we even managed to uh, create a few pickup shots, like shots that they really, I mean, they could have shot them on set, but they, they didn't have it. And in order to improve the story, it would be great with a shot like this. So we were able to manage to create a few of those which was really, uh, really, really cool. And, and this is the look development and pre-production phase is uh, super important. I mean, uh, you need to, that's the foundation of, of, uh, of all the shots. So you, you, you need to put down the time it takes to, to make really great assets. Um, we have, a, here is our four 
hero ships. We have a little turntable uh, of the Eldritch. So this is the, uh, the English ship as well. This is the Porto Carrero. I have some... Uh, um, I have some stills as well. These were kind of stills that we made in, during the look development where we were just testing. So this was not uh, designed for any specific shots or so. We were just playing around, seeing how these uh, boats held up in various uh, compositions and distances. And uh, so, uh, and it's, they are in various stages. Some of these are um, uh, work in progress. Uh, from our images from our daily folder. So here, here you can see some alterations, for example, that we did very, very easily, just uh, tweaking a few textures. Mm -hmm. And then, we have the, the rigging and cloth of the, uh, of the ship. So the base rig for the ship was very straightforward. Um, a joint uh, rig where we rigged all the masts and yards in order to do the, the little animation. And, um, and then we also did proxy versions of uh, the ships in order to be able to do previous, but also to use for the simulation purposes. Um, the challenging part of the rigging was um, all the ropes and the, and the collision sets of, of this. These ships are made up of lots of ropes, and uh, uh, we wanted as many as possible to be dynamic, but we also have a lot of ropes that are just uh, linear curves with uh, point constraints and stuff. And in retrospect, when I'm looking at these shots, you could have more ropes, you could have more ropes. And I was uh, playing with the thought of maybe you could even start just adding ropes on cards, like if you just place um, opacity maps just to break the silhouette. Because when you're looking at the real ships, man, there's so many ropes there. And it would be impossible or it would be very challenging to try to rig all of these uh, ropes and stuff dynamically. And another very important part of, um, of, uh, the, of the rigging and of the boats itself is, is the sails. If you're looking at a wide shot of, uh, of the ships and, and the sails are raised, no, uh, and the sails are down, uh, they are likely to make up maybe 50% of the ship. So the sails becomes a huge part of the, of the ship and therefore it puts a lot of, uh, uh, it, it, it becomes very important that you have uh, a lot of detail and, and good motion and stuff into the sails. And we simulated the sails using N-cloth. N-cloth is fantastic for these kinds of things. And we did um, put in a fair amount of time into finding the right dynamics, the weights and the wind directions and the motions of the sails. And uh, we also simulated the, the vertical ropes that are going around the sails like this in order to create, really simulate and, and get these creases that you get uh, from sails. And we, for the, um, for the, for the look of the, the sails, we used the V-Ray uh, double-sided shader, translucency shader, which is... Uh, it was uh, perfect for capturing. If you're ba backlighting things, all the ropes and moss and other sails are casting shadow, and it also helps a lot, you know, making, creating the look of these sails and uh, to become something very complex. Here is a little bit uh, snapshots from our dailies. Random, uh, random work during the process of when we were figuring this out. We simulated uh, raised sails here as well. We had a quite high uh, base detail into these sails as well, just in order to 
try to capture as much as possible. And we did a, a little bit of texturing of additional seams and creases and stuff, but we tried to get as much of the detail into the straight up into the simulation. Cool. Then uh, we have the water. And for the water, we had two setups. Uh, we had the look development patch, as we called it. And uh, that was a, a big square uh, of water that we generated in Houdini that we could pull in for uh, most of the still images that you saw was created by using that look development patch. It was a square patch of water you could duplicate and, and, and tile up. And that uh, patch was also very important for the shots when we were uh, um, inserting digital ships into live action because we, we placed that patch under the boat in order to capture reflections um, and things like that and, and also to, to cut the silhouette of the boat. And then we used that to composite into the real live action water. And the other, other part of the water that we did was the full CG water. And uh, uh, also um, done in Houdini, and we generated the water from the camera first room. So you, you only had the water where the, where the camera looked in order to yeah, work efficient and fast and save disk space and all that. Uh, we also had different loads for level, level of details built into that setup. So uh, high detail, close, and then it diminished with the distance. We, we, gen we created UVs for, um, for the water in order to be able to, um, to texture uh, later on. And we also um, ha uh, we exported some vertex data, like uh, information about the creases and stuff of the water so that we had material to play around with uh, later in, composition, uh, in comp. So this was the basic setup that we used for all the shots. A lot of the shots uh, where they were just maybe um, a talking, we did a lot of scenes when they were just talking on deck and then boom, replaced the water in the background. Um, in particular for a sequence when the ship was supposed to be moving forward, but it was actually shot uh, standing still. So we just replaced the water and shots like this, this setup was very good, great, just easy and, and fast to work with. And then when um, shading the water, we used the V-Ray shader and uh, we, had, uh, we had the base mesh, mesh that we got, we exported as um, a V-Ray proxy from Houdini. And then we did additional normal maps where we needed in order to boost the detail even more. And we generated uh, normal maps from other uh, oceans as well. So we had uh, kind of vector displacement and uh, um, to, um, uh, yeah, to give that extra detail into the water. And we uh, used the fog color uh, in the V-Ray shader in order to get the depth, the sense of depth when things diminishing down into the water, you get this nice green tint that becomes darker. We also used a lot of textures uh, in order to define areas of uh, calm water and uh, you know it's a little bit more blurry here and it's more crisp here and we also used the V-Ray distance node which uh, so you can use spheres to actually design this you could have a shot and you could put out some spheres I want it to be blur uh, windy here and stuff like that and that was very efficient so together with the nice uh, Houdini water and with the nice shader that we put together and the shading network that we put uh, together for the water, uh, we had a pretty decent setup to, to do water for this. And now I want to talk about the cycle setup. And since most shots of the ships was just about uh, ships going straight, like straight forward, uh, at a constant speed. We decided to create animation cycles in order to be able to do uh, plenty of shots very sw uh, swift and efficient. So we rigged the ships for the animation and we animated a 500 frame animation cycle. Um, and then we... Uh, yeah, and th that covered actually uh, I would say probably 90% of all shots using this cycle animation uh, methodology. And the sails were also simulated on, on top of this base simulation. We simulated them with the two wind speeds, I believe, a lot of wind and a little bit less of wind. We also did flags and... 
Yeah, there we go. We also did flags and banderoles um, on the ships with eight different wind directions. So you were able to just pull in a, a proxy, a video proxy, and, and uh, choose whatever the wind direction is when we, you were laying out the shot. So working with cycle was, um, that was crucial, uh, I believe, in order to pull uh, this amount of shots off on a fairly small crew. Um, Regarding simulation, uh, because all the water I've been talking about now has been mostly like geometry and, um, and uh, shading. But we, we did the uh, simulation as well. And, um, uh, and we, 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 we did this also for the 500 frames. We created a, a 500 frames uh, interactive uh, simulation where the... Uh, where the where the ship, where four main ships were interacting with, with the waters. And then we meshed that and, and exported as uh, V-Ray proxies as well. So you could pull that in as an asset as well, the collision. And that was super uh, efficient because that meant that we didn't have to do any simulation on a per shot basis. When we went into shot, uh, shot production, you, you could pull in your assets and you had uh, everything there. You didn't have to do any custom simulation and therefore we cut a lot of days uh, uh, of simulation. And uh, um, we did uh, uh, a few, uh, first I would like to mention the, the draw, the backside of this approach was that um, we couldn't do crazy big waves or anything like that. That would have required us to do custom, uh, custom water if we wanted the big swelling waves. And, but that was a trade-off um, uh, that we, uh, everyone was willing to take. Fair enough. Let's, let's uh, keep the waves small and, uh, and, uh, and make them fast instead. Um, we did a, a few custom simulation shots as well. We had a stormy ocean shot when we were doing proper simulation of the actual water surface and interactive splashing and, and things like that. But that was a handful of shots. We had one, uh, we had one sequence where um, John Malkwich or Blackbeard is pushing one of his um, uh, crew members uh, over the reeling of his ship. That one, we also did custom simulation uh, because that was a funny story with that shot. It was... Um, it was shot uh, still, it was docked, that ship, so the water didn't move. But in the story, it was, uh, it was cutting together with... Um, uh, it was uh, driving in full speed, like six, seven miles per hour or something. So we had to replace all the water and, uh, and, and do uh, all the custom simulation and having him uh, fall in there. But, uh, so we had a few of these custom simulation shots, but we kept them to a minimum. Um, we did the trails behind the boats as textures. So we did uh, we simulated 500 frames of uh, of uh, vorticity and swirling and particles, and we rendered that out, uh, out as textures. And then we could use that in our setup. Um, since we had UVs on our water, we we had a little script that were able to place this trail behind the boats, depending on where where it was in space. So that was a nice way of, um, of working with the trails. So it was all textured and, and uh, implemented in the actual shader. That also gave us a little bit flexibility in just tweaking this uh, trail in Nuke as well and just exporting a new one depending on the requirements for the shots. Uh, we did more. We, uh, we did a, a lot of other simulation work as well. We did fires and we did smoke. We had cannons uh, blasting, so we did the muscle flashes and, and trails from cannonballs as well. We did a little bit of debris and destruction of uh, breaking wood, and then of course um, uh, a fair amount of atmospherics like fogs and haze and things like that. Here's some random test. How am I doing with time? Okay, I'm. I'm I'm speeding up here. Um, uh, here's some tests that just um, yeah, random test. This is uh, just uh, a, a atmospheric test where we're trying to displace the um, the the fog uh, for ships pulling through uh, well fog, and we we have a little bit of um, 
R&D going on in, we knew that we were gonna do these explosions in the water and so we did uh, a little bit of simulation work, things like this. Um, little bit of uh, debris breaking stuff, this is always fun. I always wanted to do that shot in, uh, in Pirates of the Caribbean when they're destroying the ships, that's, that's cool. Um, so production, um, we, well, we did the previous to block out the action. Um, uh, of all the animation, and uh, we had lightweight models of all the ships, and, uh, and uh, we did, uh, it was a little bit different depending on if it was a live action uh, shot or a full CG shot. If it was live action, it was just about tracking the shot, placing our ship and doing its uh, uh, thing, but in the full CG shot, we also designed the, the whole, uh, the camera and the movement, so it was a bit more animation in there. And, uh, and we tried to keep uh, true to, the, to the, uh, the language in the movie, we tried to keep it realistic in all the camera animation, it was shot as if you were riding in a boat or if it was a helicopter shot, so not too many like uh, super crazy uh, ca camera movements. I'm gonna, this is uh, a few different previous stuff, but I'm gonna uh, proceed. I'm talking too much. Um, and the shot assembly, that was very straightforward. Um, uh, we, and that was a big part of it. We'd put all this time into pre-production, so, so we wanted the, the, the shot assembly to be very efficient. You pulled in your camera, your ships, the sails and water, and the, in the interactive water and trails, and, uh, and crew, and, uh, and the light setup. And in, in, uh, in one day, you could get a pretty darn good first draft of, of, of how shot looked. Now I want to talk about uh, the lighting and rendering and compositing. So uh, V-Ray uh, was in beta when we started this project. And we knew that there was a lot of cool features in, in the beta version that we really wanted to get access to. Uh, we had the, um, the deep support that we knew was going to be very important for us. Um, we had a major speed improvement to brute force rendering. So we talked to the nice people at Case Group and they invited us for this uh, beta and we, we launched it with the project and it, it was great. Um, and for, for lighting, the, our base, base setup was we were using a V-Ray physical sun and sky. So when you have, had assembled all the shots, you had a setup with a V-Ray sun and sky which made it very easy to just uh, do the first draft. You place the sun and the uh, time of a day and stuff, and you got a really good idea of the shots was gonna turn out. And this uh, was to uh, well, set the light direction, time of a day, but also the intensities. And once we had that, we exported, we, we created an HDRI from that uh, V-Ray sun and sky. We brought that into Nook, where we, um, where we uh, mixed it with other HDRI maps or painted in uh, cloud. So we had that as a base and then we just uh, dressed it up with uh, skies appropriate for the scene, how it was supposed to cut in the edit. And we, so that new HDRI, then we brought back for final lightning into um, Maya. And we also had some geometric clouds. So um, modeled real clouds that we put in there in order to just, you know, get some realistic and nice looking areas of, of darkness on the water and then on the ships, part of the ships could, have, could be in shadow and stuff. So this is how it looked. The top image here is, uh, top left image is the V-Ray HDRI Sun and Sky. And then we just mixed in, but based it on those intensities and those light directions, but using HDRIs to just fill in the rest and, and brought that in for, uh, for the final rendering. And we also rendered uh, a lot of AO, uh, AOVs um, to gain additional control. We had uh, AOVs for the, uh, the different materials like wood and metal on the boat, but uh, uh, we also had um, AOVs for, uh, and UVs and vertex data from the water, and all of these elements uh, became a very good base for setting, uh, setting this up in, uh, in Nook and you know, do the final tweaks of the shot there. So um, here is an example of, you can see that we are rendering reflection as uh, AOV, we're rendering the diffuse, and then we have all of these masks passes uh, enabling us uh, great control. And we use that 
to put the shots uh, together in Nook. Um, same thing with water. We, did, uh, we had some noise and we had some crease maps and stuff like that. And that was really great to be able to composite and create a little bit of white caps and things like that without having to simulate all of them. Um, we also did the compositing um, in uh, deep um, because um, uh, for the fire and smoke elements that we did, we used uh, Tempest, which is our uh, proprietary renderer that is uh, very fast on just rendering volumetrics. And, uh, and we rendered a beauty pass uh, of the actual shots in uh, V-Ray in deep so that we could uh, composite these elements together and we had no discrepancies in anti-aliasing or, or motion blurs. So that worked very well. And uh, another thing was that uh, for this show, it was the lighters was compositing their own shots because it was so intertwined in between the nook and we went back and forth uh, doing a little bit of lighting there, bringing it in in nook. So it was a lot of back and forth and that was a very nice thing. And it made, you know, it's nice for the artist to be able to author their own shots. And uh, so that we were, it, it was a very nice process. Conclusion, television series are cool. Uh, no, uh, on a serious note, no, we, we, we were very happy uh, to be able to um, uh, work on this show and we, we're, we learned a lot during the process and uh, we are super proud that we got uh, nominated for uh, WES Awards. That has led to a lot of uh, attention as well and we have some very nice and interesting projects coming up. And uh, I, I wanted, are we, how, how, how bad are we with time? Can I do a little, the, the bonus, the breakdown, two minutes. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a sneak peek also of another uh, project that we did, um, uh, no, Constantine, uh, an episode that is really cool, and it's, I'm gonna premiere it here today for you. We haven't uh, released this yet at an, any place, so have a look.
So, have I uh, destroyed the schedule? Do we have time for some Q&A? Yes, and... Okay, cool. Then, um, uh, any questions? Yeah? How many people work with you? Um, we are 40 people. 40. Yeah, 40 people and uh, we are 27 artists and, uh, and, and uh, 13 other are producers and support personnel. Mm. Uh, As, um, uh, how do you mean? Um, that uh, yeah, that happens. I mean, especially on on, on some of the big uh, projects, uh, there is w always a lot of vendors involved, and uh, so that happens. But uh, yeah, we do a lot of uh, our own uh, work internally as well. Most of it, uh, yeah. Yeah. Do you use free, any freelancers? Yes, we do. Um, we do f use freelancers uh, ever uh, when we have peaks and stuff uh, with projects. In October last year, when we were doing the crunch for for the Constantine, then uh, we were about 50 people in our office, so we we had a, a, a little bit of extra um, personnel in there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, what was the biggest? Um, that is uh, that's a tough question. I mean, it was uh, everything went uh, quite smooth in terms of rendering. I would say that the biggest hurdle would be that now we were using Tempest for uh, our own render for the volumetrics, and then uh, and then uh, the V-Ray for all the beauty work. And I guess that uh, that is uh, it, it's always nice if you can do just one beauty render and. Uh, I'm not sure, maybe that's not, uh, yeah, that, that, that was the most annoying part, I would say, uh, the process of setting those scene ups and have m multiple scenes. Hmm? I have another Tempest question, as you just mentioned. I always see the problem that you render beauty, and then in the end, you put in your, everything's black and matte, and mm. you put it on the volumetrics, mm. and you have your light shaft, mm. and then you have reflections mm. that don't Uh, reflections of the volumetrics in the water, for example. Yeah, exactly. So this is one of the hurdles. That what we did was that we did mesh the we mesh the explosion, for example, and camera projected the the tempest render onto that to get the reflections down in the water. But we could also do a reflection pass in tempest just to capture uh, capture that. But in, in the case of the explosion, we did that. That's a little bit messy. Uh, yes, yes. Mm. Mm. Any other questions? Um, did you have a lot of changes when you were producing, starting doing the shots from the assets? Or shots? Not, not at all. And that's what w w was one of the main po uh, points that the process was very, very smooth. That they had a great understanding, we had a great relationship in, in talking, and the communication went very smooth. And, and so uh, it was. Uh, it was quite straight to point. We, we, we came to the, which is fantastic and, and not always uh, the case. Mm. Any other questions? Yeah? That is true. But yeah, yeah. So, so, so why or how? how? No, but we just, uh, we, I guess we were naive and uh, we, we determined that, I mean, we had been working abroad, me and my colleagues, for a few years in, in uh, London, in the blooming industry there, and in, uh, my friend uh, Jaffe worked in uh, Los Angeles. And one day we felt like it's, it would be nice to settle. We have all our friends and family at home, and, and we, uh, we were very inspired by all the great work and the technology and all, you know, the focus on research and development and all that cool stuff that all these international companies did. And we wanted to do that at home. We have a lot of talents in Sweden, so I mean, finding people um, has been quite successful. And there's also a lot of Swedes uh, in uh, uh, working all over the world. And one day when they come home, then we have set up a company for them to, <laughs> to work at. Yeah? Yeah? Did you do any uh, photometric um, scanning photography work with the Vasa ship? 
No, we, no, no, no. Yeah, no, we didn't. That was more for references and stuff since, um, yeah, no. That was more for ins in inspiration and stuff. We did a little bit of uh, photo. Uh, we did um, we did something like that for the. Uh, we, we we had a, a great helicopter plate of the two uh, digi double shapes that we're gonna do, and we tracked them in order to get uh, you know some some great point clouds in order to set the scales and references from when we were building them. But uh, no no real photogrammetry like that. Any, anyone else? Then, uh, well, I'm. Thanks, I, thank you very much for my time. Thank you, Case Group, for inviting me.